Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Preparedness Podcast, where we try to bring you the best in preparedness information. My name is Rob Hannes. I'll be the host for the show. This is September 2012. It is National Preparedness Month. Uh, it's a really good month for us preppers because it's basically our month. And uh, for National Preparedness Month, I've got an article up on the website I put out this past weekend, and it's about using September as the month that um, you review and update all your preps. Since you should be reviewing and updating all your preps once a year anyways, let's make September the month that we do it because it's a, it's a good reminder. You're going to hear someplace that it's National Preparedness Month, so it's a good month to, to go through your evacuation bags, your uh, survival kits, your food storage, uh, and all those things that you have that you know count as your preps for just in case emergencies. Go through it, make sure it is up to date. You know, replace things that need need to be replacing. Um, I have this article out that lists basically everything that I could think of that you should be going through. So when you get a chance, head out over to the website at thepreparednesspodcast.com and do a search for National Preparedness Month, and you'll see that article come right up. Uh, The last two podcasts that I did were about EMP and uh, coronal mass ejection and their effects on uh, the earth and how it can affect us and what it means for us. I've had a really great response from those two podcasts. And what I've done is I've taken all that information and I've put it on several articles on the website so that uh, if you want to be able to access that information without having to listen to uh, the one hour set of podcasts, you'll be able to go to the website and uh, get all the information there. Also this past weekend, uh, I put a couple of new PDFs up on the site Um, I think I've talked about this before, but the Preparedness 101 meetup group that I'm a part of uh, has a discussion board. And one of the members put up this um, Utah County Extension PDF, and basically it's called uh, Ready Quick Mix. And it's kind of like a bisquick uh, substitute. You can make it on your own and includes a bunch of recipes. Uh, I was going through that, and I thought it was a really good resource for uh, food storage. And there's a sister document that goes with that called soup or sauce mix or something like that. Anyways, um, I thought these were really good. So what I did is I put them up on the website as well as a couple links to the uh, original documents. But I also, I wanted to archive them on the site in case they ever disappeared. So you you could head over and, and take a look at that. I thought they were pretty decent for your food preps. A quick note on the uh, growing pains that we seem to be having. A couple of the listeners have uh, sent me an email, or actually there were comments through the website saying they were having issues uh, getting the podcast. They don't subscribe through iTunes, and they, they weren't able to get the, a couple of the podcasts right away. Um, I narrowed this down to, I think it was an issue in the XML file, where basically that's the file that points to where all the podcasts are located. Uh, but I'm very curious to know if anybody else is having issues. I think I've corrected it. But I would really like to know if anybody's having issues. Uh, and likewise, if you're having issues with the website or anything, I would like to know so I can I can fix it. Uh, and you know, send me an email at rob at prepcast.info and let me know any problems you might have experienced. Also, along that same uh, area, uh, I've been working with the newsletter service provider, and we have identified an issue. Um, however, you know what, their customer support has been really good and they have not been avoiding my concerns. They haven't been ignoring my emails. They've addressed everything. So what I've decided to stick with them. And if you can hang with me a little bit longer on this, I'm, I'm hoping we can get this cleared up. I'm currently working with them to see about restarting the weekly tips without any duplicates. Uh, however, we just may have to reset the whole thing. Luckily, it's it's at the beginning, and from what I can see, it would only be a few people that would actually receive any sort of duplicate. So if we do reset this and you do start getting duplicates, please, uh, you have my apologies. Um, we should be able to get through this, and hopefully this will be the last problem we have. Okay, so uh, if you haven't already, check us out on Twitter and Facebook. Uh, Facebook is uh, Preparedness Podcast. And on Twitter, the uh, you can find us at PrepCast. 
I'm finding that Twitter is a really great way of communicating with you, the listeners, as far as things that come up outside of the podcast. I mean, I only do the podcast once or twice a, a week. There's tons of stuff that comes up between them. So I've been tweeting out things like articles that are on the website, um, any sort of prepper related news stories that I've come across and, and all sorts of great stuff like that. So uh, head over. If you have a Twitter account, please follow us at, uh, you know, PrepCast. And if you don't have a Twitter account, uh, check it out. It is, it's free and it's kind of fun and there's a good way to find a lot of information. Uh, there's a lot of preppers that are on there and a lot of people who have prep information on there. They're always kind of pushing it out and stuff. It's another good resource for you to find more information. If you've gone to the section in the website called preparedness capability checklist, you may have noticed that it isn't there. The reason for that is because I've taken it down because I'm turning it into a Kindle ebook uh, and I'm going to release it uh, soon. Basically what I've done is I've taken that checklist and I've expanded as far as like why they exist and how to use the checklist and stuff. Uh, it's a great planning and evaluation tool. Uh, and I really hope that should be available soon. Uh, if you go to that, page though you'll see there's a little sign up there that basically you put your email there and um, you'll get notified when it actually is available on uh, uh, Kindle coming up in October uh, October 6th and 7th is the Arizona Survivalist Prepper Expo my wife and I are planning on going and I know there are a lot of Arizona preppers here uh, hopefully some of you are listening to the show because um, if you're planning on going to the expo uh, look for us. We're going to be the ones in the t-shirt with the preparedness podcast logo on them. Uh, we'll, we're not going to have a booth. We're just going to be walking around, but please feel free to stop us and say, hi, we'd love to meet you. I would like to thank our sponsors that we have both on the podcast and on the website. Uh, and the best way you can help support this show is to support our advertisers. And for those of you that have already have, thank you. We have a new sponsor, Backwoods Home Magazine. I love this magazine. I remember when it first came out, it was it was it was a cool magazine because it it had all the information about stuff I didn't know and stuff I wanted to know about, like you know, homesteading and building your own log cabin and how to raise chickens and and great stuff like that. And you know, it only comes out six times a year, once every two months. And by that time, I was well done with it. I couldn't wait for the next issue. So I'm really excited to have them as a sponsor. And one of the new things they have going on at Backwoods Home is they've just released an eight-book Ask Jackie series. Now, Jackie Clay is a longtime contributor to the magazine. She has a lot of knowledge on the basics of like homesteading and, and canning and stuff. And what they've done is they've taken all this information and they've released a, an eight-book series uh, of all her great stuff, all this information that she has. And so if your goal is to be as self-reliant as possible, uh, she's going to be one of the resources that you're going to want to have. Uh, the series, these eight books, uh, include animals, canning basics, food storage, gardening, homestead cooking, homesteading, uh, pressure canning, and water bath canning. Now, these are all basic skills that, you know, you're going to want to have to be as self-reliant as possible. So if Backwoods Home Magazine is one of those things that you've never heard of, you're missing out on a great resource, or if you've used to get them and somehow you just never renewed that subscription, now is a great time to do it. So head on over to our website, and on the right-hand side, you're going to see their big, beautiful banner. Uh, click on it, and you'll be taken directly to the website, and you can check out this new series by Jackie Clay. Okay, so the main topic of this podcast is going to be the basic survival kit. This is going to be the eighth podcast in the Back to Basics series. Now, some of you more advanced preppers might be thinking, hey, whoa, I don't need any information on no basic survival kit. But honestly, it really helps to go back and review. Uh, a lot of times we get so caught up in the more intricate and complex levels of being prepared that we often overlook a lot of the basic and mundane stuff. So I think it's important to to make sure that we cover the basics. And that's one of the things that I wanted to do when I relaunched this podcast was to make sure that we cover the basics so we're all basically at the same level so that 
Um, if you need a review or let's say your brother-in-law or your sister-in-law or your, your, your mom's gardener decides that they're interested in being prepared, you have resources that you can point them to, to basically say, Hey, go ahead and listen to this podcast or go to this website. And you know, this is going to get you started in the right direction. Now, just to be clear, this isn't going to be an everything kit. This is going to cover the basics because the basics are what really are going to make sure that you can survive uh, an emergency. Looking at the survival hierarchy of needs from episode 115, we know that the basic needs for survival are air, food, water, shelter, fire, sanitation, and I would add first aid to that uh, when I'm talking about a survival kit. This is the minimum amount of stuff that you want to put into your kit. So to start with, let's look at air. Now, typically we don't really think about breathing much. It's something that happens naturally all the time. However, there are times when we do need to make sure that the air we're breathing is uh, as clean as possible because the environment that we are in Uh, might have dust or smoke or some sort of particulate matter that we don't want to breathe in. Now, for this, I'm not really talking about pandemics or um, flus or anything like that. If you've caught some of my previous podcasts on this, you know I'm a big proponent of the N100 masks. Uh, For this, though, uh, I would just suggest uh, an N95 mask, but one that has an exhaust valve. The exhaust valve allows the moisture uh, in your exhalation breath to escape without actually, you know, getting into the filter media. And even though it seems like um, a a wet filter would be a more efficient filter, it it actually isn't. So uh, for you to be able to wear the mask on a prolonged basis, uh, the exhaust valve really makes a big difference. Now, why would we need a dust mask in everyday life? Well, you know, take a look at 9-11. Uh, we had basically a, a terrorist bombing, and we had a building collapse, and it produced a lot of um, smoke and debris and uh, dust in the air. And if you could protect yourself from breathing that, not only would you uh, have a much easier time getting out of the area, uh, but you would you know, possibly prevent some health issues down the line. There are some other reasons we want to have the mass besides um, terrorist bombings. You know, earthquakes can make the buildings collapse too. There's a lot of dust uh, that come with that. Wildfires produce smoke. And actually anybody who lives in or around vo- uh, volcanoes, you know, if they erupt, then you've got all this this ash and stuff in the air. You don't want to breathe that. So the N95 masks make it really easy to store into your uh, your kit simply because they're um, they can be very compact. Now some of the masks are molded and they're like preformed shapes. Uh, they don't pack very well. The mask that I use, the N95 mask that I prefer for uh, this is the 3M 9211. It's a very flat storing mask except for the little bump with the exhaust valve. But they're they're really easy to store. Uh, they're generally less than two bucks each. And um, they work really well. Now, this next item, I'll admit, isn't generally something you find in a basic survival kit. However, I've been in the wilds enough, and I've been very sensitive about things poking me in the eye. Um, I uh, Well, <laughs> getting things in my eye at all just really is a pain. Um, so I've always kind of tried to have some sort of protective eyewear with me. And if you think about it, if you work in an urban environment where the risk of a building collapse or terrorism or any sort of smoke and dust uh, environment, you know, you may want to consider having some sort of goggles, even if they're prescription goggles, uh, even if you just want to go with some basic swim goggles uh, because they're very compact. Uh, it's something to consider about. I don't think there's enough um, attention that's paid to the eyes when we're talking about survival kits. And if you think about it, if you can't see, your efficiency probably decreases by 90%. The next item is food. What we want here is something that's shelf-stable, which means we don't need any refrigeration. Uh, We want a long shelf life or an expiration date that is at least a couple years into the future. We need to be aware of where we're going to store it. If it's going to be in a high heat environment, say the trunk of your car and you're in the Southwest desert, or perhaps even in the Midwest during the summer, 
you know, you want something that is going to be able to withstand that heat. Uh, chocolate bars aren't going to do it. Candy bars aren't going to do it. Some of the energy bars like Mojo or Cliff might not be too bad, uh, but you may want to go ahead and test them as far as how well they handle the heat. What I like to put in my, my kits that are going to be um, in storage for a while or in the car are either the mainstay bars. Uh, some people like the Daytrex bars. I prefer the taste of the mainstay. Or what I've been uh, using lately are these uh, Millennium Energy Bars from Cheaper Than Dirt. Uh, they're 400 calories per bar, and you can get like, I think it's like 10 of them for 10 bucks. So they're, they're pretty reasonable. But the reason I like them is because I can basically open up one bar and, you know, if I need a snack or if I'm feeling kind of woozy or if I need an energy boost, I can just I can just take the one bar. I don't have to open up. Uh, I'm sure you've seen the mainstays where they're 2,400 or 3,600 um, calories in this, this one pack. If you open that up just for a little bit of food, you're basically wasting the entire rest of the food. So I like the little bars like that, um, whether they're energy bars or uh, these Millennium bars are good. You can look at jerky. Uh, you know, freeze-dried and dehydrated food is perfectly acceptable here. The only issue is that you're going to have to have a way to uh, not only uh, boil water, but you're probably going to need to either carry extra water or find a way to, you know, get more water. Uh, I'd throw some hard candy in there, too. You know, the sugar um, helps with your energy, and it's a little bit of a morale boost. The next thing we need to look at putting into our kit is the water category. Uh, water is very important in order to survive anything. Uh, you can go very small, uh, like something like iodine tablets or the uh, iodine crystals. I think the two leading uh, types for the tablets is the uh, um, portable aqua. And uh, for crystals, we've got the polar pure. Uh, I've used them both and they do work very well. Even if you decide to go with a filter, keep these as a backup. They're so small and uh, like the Polar Pure, I mean, it can, that little jar can make enough iodine solution to treat a lot of water. Uh, it's a great backup. Uh, if you go with the tablets or even the iodine crystals, um, either have the, uh, the PA plus, which is a little bit of uh, azorbic acid or have your own vitamin C that'll help take away a lot of the iodine taste. If you want to go with a water filter, uh, probably a pump type, uh, even though the uh, the Berkey has a new miniature drip um, filter, you may want to check that out over at LPC Survival. Um, I prefer a Katadin Combi. I've had it for a long time. Um, but you know what? For a basic kit, all you need to do is have something that, that provides a minimum of 100 gallons because, you know, even at three gallons a day, that's still going to give you a month's worth of uh, water filtration. You're going to need containers, something to put the water in. Uh, this can be, you know, Camelbacks, uh, a Nalgene bottle, a canteen, or um, something I've seen recently that I really, really like. They're collapsible flasks. They're basically um, this food-grade plastic with a, with a nozzle on it, and um, they when they're empty, they're flat. They're no more than a few mils thick, uh, but they can hold up to a half liter or even a liter's worth of water. They're, they're quite convenient. I would also throw in some sort of metal cup. Um, not only does it allow you to like mix a, any sort of drink mixes or coffee or tea, but, or even melting snow, but it allows you to, you know, cook, uh, anything you might have. If you're sensitive to iodine, or if you're looking for an alternative, Canadian has a set of tablets called MicroPure that are chlorine-based. Uh, they're chlorine dioxide, which is, I think, the, basically the same thing that the uh, the towns and the cities use to um, treat their water. Um, they're very easy to carry, and they've got you know a greater than five-year shelf life. So that is that's a good alternative if you're looking for something other than iodine. Whether you go with the um, the iodine or the uh, chlorine-based tablets. Uh, those and a metal cup and a one liter flexible flask, and you, you have a pretty decent emergency water kit. We've been talking about the basic survival kit and how it's one of those foundations that you should uh, have a good understanding of so you can go ahead and make other survival kits based on this. Uh, but before we continue, I want to go ahead and get to our sponsor for the podcast. 
last week I told you about Legacy Foods from BuyEmergencyFoods.com. And if you're looking for food stores, especially if you've just started preparing, I know it can be quite intimidating to look at all the choices that are out there, along with all the other aspects that you need to take into account to be prepared. We've already learned that food is one of the most basic needs of survival. So if you don't have food storage, you have a serious gap in your preps. However, you can easily fix this by simply going to our website and clicking on the buyemergencyfoods.com banner or the preparewise.com banner. And in, within a matter of minutes, you can take care of this basic need. And once you do, you're going to have a really good, peaceful feeling. Know that you've got your food storage taken care of. And I think that you're going to like the legacy food because it's got a shelf life of 25 years. Uh, they're easy to make. You don't have to worry about a recipe or something. You just basically add the water and uh, warm it up, and it, it's made. It's it's there. And these things taste good, so it's, it's a no-brainer solution to go ahead and start your food storage. Or if you already got food storage, add another level of variety to what you already have because basically, you know, food is what we like, food is what we eat, and food is what we need. Continuing with our topic of basic survival kits, uh, the next thing we need to get into is shelter. Now, we're not looking at a tent or, you know, one of these blow-up domes or anything. We just need basic shelter to keep the, the elements of weather off of us. Um, you know, at the very basic level, we're looking at a tarp or a military poncho, uh, possibly some other waterproof material. Um, I've seen some of these ultra lightweight backpackers use Tyvek as a uh, lightweight, waterproof, but breathable tarp. Uh, I don't know how well they work. I do know they're really loud, um, but, you know, that might be a, a one way that you can look at providing, you know, some sort of waterproof tarping material. You're going to need a lot of cordage. Um, parachute cord is preferred because of the way it's made. It's got this outer sheath and it's got seven inner layers that you can basically strip out. And so you can use the sheath to, um, as one form of cordage. And then you've got all these, uh, seven little strings that you can use for other things. So, um, pack as much as you can, because if you do get caught out in the wilderness, you're going to find that you go through cordage way faster than you would ever imagine. Just because it's a basic survival kit doesn't mean that every item in it has to be you know, completely basic. Uh, one of the items that I like for shelter is an item called a land shark bag. And you can get this at landshark-online.com. I'll have a link to it in the show notes so it's easy to get to. But basically, this is like a, a tarp bag. Um, it's completely sealed on all the sides except for where you crawl in. And it makes basically an instant tarp shelter that you don't have to worry about uh, the wind getting up underneath the, the flap or laying on a cold, uh, cold, wet earth. It's it's a pretty cool thing to have. A little bit on the expensive side, but I think it's worth it, if, especially when you're talking about your survival. Another basic need for survival is fire. Fire provides you with so many benefits that it's important to have it and to make sure you can start it uh, no matter what. Uh, as we have said countless times on the podcast, you need to have three different ways of doing the same thing. And that's basically a primary and two backups. And it's really important with fire. I prefer the steel and flint units that uh, are becoming very popular. I think it's because, you know, they're pretty simple and they work really well. Uh, a lot of them are basically a flint stick with a piece of hacksaw blade uh, kind of tethered to it. Those work well. I have something called a uh, strike force. I've had it for probably a minimum of 15 or 20 years, probably 20 years now. And it works great. I mean, it, I've used it many times and it's still working great. There's still lots of sparker bar left to it. There's also basically, I think it's called a blast match or a, uh, uh, one of those, it's, it's supposed to be a one-handed striker bar. Those those work okay too. Um, but, you know, you can have a, a butane lighter is very convenient. It doesn't work too well when it's cold. And if the butane leaks out, it, it doesn't work hardly at all. Uh, I used to think that even if the butane leaked out, it would still be a sparking unit. But I've actually had a couple of my lighters uh, seize up on me somehow. I don't know 
what exactly happened to him, but they, the sparker wheel doesn't rotate anymore, and so it doesn't even produce sparks. So uh, butane lighters have actually fallen way down on my ability to light fire. They're convenient, but when they fail, they fail big. Uh, tinder is something you're going to have to have. Um, probably some of the best and easiest stuff to do is to make your own. Uh, you take cotton balls. And you coat them with Vaseline. I mean, it's a messy job, and you might as well just, you know, dive right in and get it and just get it all over your hands so you can really get that Vaseline into the cotton. And then put those cotton balls into, you know, a small container like a 35-millimeter uh, film canister, which are becoming more and more difficult to find because everybody's using digital cameras. But uh, if something like that works really well. Another form of tinder that works really well and is free is dryer lint. This works extremely well, especially after you uh, drying some like blankets or sweaters or something uh, because of the, uh, the fibrous material that's in there. Um, just, you know, take a bunch of it. You can stuff it into a little container, like, you know, one of those little film canisters. Uh, it, you don't even need Vaseline with it, but the Vaseline will help. Um, once it catches fire, it'll help burn longer so you can get your fire started. But that's another great tinder. Uh, matches are always good to have. Uh, they have, you know, one strike per match, but you can carry them in, in a kit and have some as a backup uh, for starting fire. Um, be careful with magnesium bars. I know a lot of people like these, but I've seen enough that don't work that you need to be very careful. And basically what this is, it's supposed to be a bar of magnesium. But a lot of the cheaper ones, or the ones that don't work, they're basically a magnesium alloy, and there is not enough magnesium in there to actually start a fire. I mean, I, I couldn't even get the one I had to start with a propane torch, let alone a spark. I also find the, uh, the grinding off the magnesium to be uh, far too much work that, for what it's worth. Um, I would rather just go with uh, some tinder and a sparker and and be done with it. Um, typically, my third way of starting fires is to use a sparking device. Uh, the one I have is called Sparklight Fire Starter from, coincidentally, Sparklight. And all this is is basically the uh, the sparker wheel and flint like you would have in a lighter, uh, but that's all it is. And it's if you go, hold it up to the light, you can see typically there's like, I think, three, four, maybe five little uh, flints in there. And so it'll last quite a long time, and it works very well. Okay, now hygiene and sanitation are important. Uh, you don't actually need these to survive. However, um, survival often is about having good morale, and these definitely uh, provide for good morale. And the basic components would be toilet paper, wipes, and hand sanitizer. Uh, I would also add to that a toothbrush with either you know, a little tube of toothpaste or possibly some salt and baking soda. The salt and baking soda will last a lot longer and probably be more heat tolerant. Now, the toilet paper and the hand sanitizer have other uses. Uh, you can use both to start a fire. Uh, the hand sanitizer, if it actually has enough alcohol in it, will burn. In fact, this is a good way to test if your hand sanitizer is still able to kill germs. Uh, you can squirt a little bit out, and if it lights, then you know there's enough alcohol in it. However, please be careful because an alcohol flame is invisible or nearly invisible, and you may not see that it's actually on fire. I was actually testing this earlier today by taking some of the uh, hand sanitizer that we have that was old and testing it, and it actually burns. And it's really kind of weird because... You can hear it crackling, and you can kind of hear the the bubbling of the hand sanitizer because there's you know there's other stuff besides just alcohol, and you know you can hear it, you can feel the heat coming off if you put your hand above it, but it's really hard to see. I probably took I don't know 50 or 60 digital pictures trying to find some flame that was in there. I actually did catch one, so I'll put it on the website so so you can see. But you do need to be careful because it's it's nearly invisible. Now, the last part of the basic survival kit is first aid. Uh, this can be a small basic kit that supplies you with, you know, Band-Aids, antibiotic cream, gauze pad, gauze rolls, and tape. However, to that, I would add over-the-counter medicines like painkillers, allergy, uh, stuff like that. If you have any uh, prescription medicines that you literally cannot live without, 
they should be in your survival kits. Uh, you need to make sure you rotate through them so that they don't expire, and you may have to uh, waste some of them if they're in a high heat environment. But if this is something you need in order to you know maintain life, then you definitely should have these. I would also add some tweezers, um, possibly some foot powder or mole skin, depending on what works best for you. Uh, lip balm and sunblock are always good things to have. And you know what? Uh, some sort of stimulant probably is a good idea, you know, whether it's a uh, Vibrin or five hour energy, uh, or even some packs of freeze dried coffee and sugar, uh, that would probably help you stay awake so that you can, you know, either make sure the bear doesn't come into your car or, you know, be able to walk to where you need to get to. Now that's it for a basic survival kit. Now keep in mind, the basic survival kit is only designed to basically keep you alive. It doesn't mean you're going to be comfortable. It doesn't mean you're going to have any sort of convenience. It's just basically to get you through a period of emergency or crisis or disaster until such time you're either rescued or things go back to normal or you can get out of that situation. So it is missing some things. And just to cover, to make sure I'm covering all the bases, I want to go over some of that so that if you have room in your pack, you should consider adding some of these things. Also, remember, this is a core basic kit. If you have a special need or if you have, uh, say, you're going to make a, a bug out bag or an evacuation bag or a bug back bag, which means you're going to get home from work or wherever you are, you know, you're going to make sure you have additional things in that. And some of those will be the following. Uh, a whistle. For as small as whistles are, they are really efficient forms of communication. Uh, you, you know, you can blow into a whistle and that sound carries for a, a long way, much, much farther than you can yell. And it's a lot less tiring. It would be a good idea to include some tools like a knife, uh, maybe a, a multi-tool like a Gerber or a Leatherman or a Swiss Army knife, you know, for your for the main knife, it should be a fixed blade with a full tang, something about six inches long for the blade itself, and it needs to be rugged and sturdy enough that you could basically um, pound it through another piece of wood uh, so that you can make firewood. It needs to be something that you can trust your life to. I would add a, a compass along with a map of the general area that you're uh, mostly within. You know, this can be as complicated or as simple as um, you need it to be. I would include some heavy-duty aluminum foil. There are so many uses that you can use it. Uh, and if, everything from catching water to uh, a pot lid. Um, you can use little strips of it as uh, fishing lures. Um, you can use it as signaling mirrors. It's got a lot of uses, so I would definitely include some of that. Uh, a flashlight, uh, especially an LED flashlight that uses battery power very efficiently and some spare batteries. Now I would say that you should probably make it a headlamp, you know, one of the ones that go on your head so you can keep your hands free. Uh, you know, a few of these Siloom light sticks would be handy too. Those are the ones that, you know, you crack and you shake and they start to glow. Um, those would be really handy in a situation where you needed area light, uh, but you didn't necessarily need bright light. In this modern technical world that we live in, you probably want to stick a, a charging cord for your uh, mobile phone so that you can charge your phone from your car or from wherever. And because a lot of us don't remember phone numbers anymore because we have them programmed into our smartphones or the speed dial on our uh, home phone, you should have a printed list of the contacts. So if you lose your phone or if it gets damaged or uh, if it just runs out of battery power, you can still make some calls from either somebody else's phone or a pay phone or, or a landline or something like that. Now, the container for your basic survival kit will depend on what you're building it for. Typically, you're going to want to keep it in some sort of backpack that makes it easy to carry, but it could be contained in nearly anything, anything from a small Altoids can to a large duffel bag. Now, even though um, we've, we've covered the basics and expanded on some of that, there are still shortcomings to this kit that we've just gone through. Um, there's no clothing, no outer gear, uh, no, not even spare socks. Uh, you have no defensive capability in this kit. You have no communications, 
Now, you, you can signal with the whistle, but you don't have any ability to transmit or receive information like uh, through a uh, ham radio or an AM FM radio. Uh, there's no money in this kit. Um, you have no spare eyeglasses for those of you who need them. Uh, and you don't really have any other tools other than those few small items I mentioned. Um, you know, some things you'd want to have would be things you can make better shelter with. But this basic kit is a really good starting point for basically all of your kits that you would want to make. Um, for example, if you're going to make a bug out kit, you're going to want to start here and you're going to want to add those things that are going to allow you to be self-reliant for a longer period of time. And typically these are things like building better shelter, um, being able to obtain or gather food and water, uh, and be able to do things like that. Likewise, if you're going to be building a vehicle kit, uh, you don't have to worry about, you know, carrying all this stuff on your back because the vehicle does the the, the carrying for you so you can add things um, that are heavier you know you're going to want to definitely add some re uh, repair tools and uh, equipment so you can make repairs to the vehicle um, you're going to want to add some you know just general fluids oil uh, coolant uh, stuff like that i'd also look at including things like extra clothing and sleeping gear uh, and, I, and if i'm going to be in a snow environment or the possibility of a snow environment uh, you know, some some heavy clothing, uh, an ice scraper. Uh, you're going to want to probably have an, uh, a snow shovel so you can dig yourself out of drifts and stuff. Um, you probably even want to add things like an axe or a saw or a hatchet so you can either, you know, get some really good firewood or build yourself a shelter. And since the vehicle is doing all the heavy lifting, so to speak, uh, as long as you've got this space, you should be able to pack it. So that wraps it up for the Basic Survival Kit podcast. Uh, I know this is probably a review for most of you, but I hope you've learned something. Until next time, folks, enjoy life and be safe.